Good evening. Open up those hymnals to 434. Revive us again, 434. Turn back to 92. Oh, how I love Jesus. 92. Sweetest name on earth. 
Thank you, ladies. Good evening. You know, I don't know why people complain about our weather in Minnesota. It's just another day in paradise. It was nice today, wasn't it? Did you get some work done outside today? All right, good. <laughs> yeah, it was a beautiful day. You know, it, it's kind of interesting. How many of you learned something new in these meetings? <laughs> Every hand goes up. You know, one of the joys of holding meetings like this, and I've done several myself over the years, and one of the joys is being up front and watching your expressions on your face when all of a sudden the light bulb comes on and, and you, or, or you hear something you hadn't heard before and your mouth flies open. and It's just kind of fun to watch. And, and, and it's, it's inspiring for the speaker because they know, ah, they got it. And it's a joy just to see that, to know that the Spirit is working and that we're all learning something, even myself. You know, as many years as I've been doing this, and every time it seems like Joel presents something, I see something new, or he shares something I hadn't thought of before, or looks at it in a different way. So, you know, and in a way, it's the same way with church. Anybody that goes to church and says, well, I didn't get anything out of church today, really didn't go for the right reasons. Because if you're paying attention and really thinking about it, you should get something out of every time you go. And so, again, we want to remind you of the gifts. Five nights, the Bible promise book. So, and we're doing fine with those. Now, the Bibles, we're running a little short. We have to order some more. That's for ten nights. We have a couple of them left. But if we run out, be sure and give the ladies your name so that they can put you on the list and we'll be sure and, and, and get it for you. The same way with the concordance. We had no idea we were going to have so many people and, and so many people who had come so many nights. And so we're going to be pretty short on those because tomorrow night's night 15. And if you're a couple and you both can get a book, that's not a problem. But if you would for now, if you would when you come tomorrow night, just get one book between the two of you. And then we'll have some more on order. And, and so when we get them in, then, then your spouse can get one also. You can decide which one gets the first one. I'm not going there. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, it, take it home with you. And, and, uh, and then when the other one comes in, we'll be sure and get that to you. We're just not quite sure how many more we need to order at this point. But, uh, again, it's so good to have each and every one of you here. It's such a blessing seeing you from night to night, getting to know your names and, and your stories. And so now it's time for our theme song again. So, Tanya. Marvelous message we bring, glorious carol we sing, wonderful words of the King, Jesus is coming again, coming again, coming again, maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, but sure. How many of you know that song now? <laughs> that, was the, that was the whole purpose of that, you know, so you can learn a new song and go home with it. That's why we have that theme song, so praise the Lord. All right, well, we're here. We are on night 14. That's, that's impressive because that means you're two-thirds of the way through the whole seminar, which means we're running up to the end very soon. So glad to see you all here. So tonight again is another important topic. We're going to be these next two nights where these topics fit together. Okay, uh, you maybe have noticed a lot of times we'll have two or three topics and they kind of they kind of fit together in a grouping. And I've done that for us, so they kind of put together in a grouping. And so tonight we're going to be talking about you are not your own, and tomorrow night we're going to be talking about how to be free from bondage. And, and both of those are going to go together, so we're going to kind of see them. You'll see how they interact as we get through there. And, of course, we just got done with a three-part, kind of a three-part series. And we're going to be talking about, um, we talked about what happens when we die with seances and ghosts. We talked about the millennial period, and we talked about what hell would look like 
according to the Bible, how the Bible describes hell, and so we're going to review that tonight together. So let's take a look what the Bible says. Quiz question number one, does the word hell in the Bible always mean a place of burning? It does not. Remember that the word hell is translated from three different words in the Hebrew, well, four different words. Uh, the Hebrew word Sheol in the Old Testament is, is just means the grave. And in the New Testament, Hades just means the grave. It's the hole they dig to throw your body in when you're done with it, right? And that's what, all it means is the grave. And then there's a couple of times, one time it, mean, it is translated from the word Tartaru, which is, which is a place of torment or incarceration, which is speaking of the angels who are incarcerated here on this earth. Since they've been cast out of heaven, they can't go anywhere. They're here until their sentence is meted out to them. And then about, was it 15 or 14 times? I forget. It's translated from the word Gehenna, which literally means that, uh, like a place of burning. It comes from the Valley of Hinnom, where they sacrificed children to the god Molech and all those kind of things and became a place of uncleanness and 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 an abomination and in jesus day it was the garbage dump because nothing nobody would live there it was unclean it was abominable and so they would dump all their garbage there and they would be it was constantly be smoldering and burning you remember those years ago when we had the gar garbage dumps remember you know you just go up and you dump the stuff over the over the side of the hill and it was just smoldering and smelly and that's kind of gehenna that's what that term means so the Bible, most times, when you see the word hell, it does not mean a place of burning. It, most times, like 41 or 42 times out of the 54 times in the Bible, it just means the grave. So you need to understand how that is translated. Quiz question number two, the trans tr traditional idea of hell is that Satan is in charge of hell right now, torturing those that have died. Where does that idea come from? A, the Bible teaches it. B, it's Greek mythology and other pagan religions. Or C, it's a Jewish wives' tale. B, that's right. It came from Greek mythology. The idea of Hades and the god Hades ruling over Hades and torturing the, the wicked that are... That's all a Greek wives' tale. And it all kind of seeped its way in through the centuries into the Christian ideology. Quiz question number three. Will hellfire ever go out? According to the Bible, it has to. Because God says hell is on earth, the wicked are recompensed upon the earth, fire comes, falls from heaven and burns them up on the earth, and as they're being burned, then, then God is going to recreate a new heavens and a new earth. So eventually, we don't know how long, the Bible doesn't give us indication how long that is going to be, but God is going to recreate a new heavens and new earth, so that fire has to go out because you're not going to be tiptoeing around fire burning around. Well, it's a new heavens and a new earth. I mean, it's going to be a joyful, wonderful place. And the Bible says that the wicked are turned to ashes beneath the soles of your feet. Ashes don't burn, right? They're done. The devil himself, when we look in Ezekiel, it says that he too is going to be, God says, I'm going to turn you into ashes and you shall never be any more. So the devil, too, is going to be gone. He's going to be ash. And so the sin and the sinner and the root of sin is all gone. And it's done with. God says affliction shall not rise a second time. All right. So tonight we're going to be talking about you are not your own. Before we open God's word tonight, though, I'm going to pray again for the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. So bow your heads and pray with me, please. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that you're here tonight. Lord, we know that you have been with us day by day and evening by evening as we've gone through your word, as we opened your word, Lord, because your word promises you would be here, where two or more are gathered in your name. There you are in their midst. And so, Lord, as you walk amongst us tonight, up and down these aisles, and speaking to each and every one of us through your word, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us vividly and, and candidly. Lord, I pray that your word would speak to us so that we would have a clear understanding of your desire for us and that we would all understand that we are not our own, but we are yours. So we pray this, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. <clears throat> so tonight I want to introduce to you five things that I look for and you should look for when you're studying Scripture. Five things, five Ps, really. 
It's kind of a good way, to, it's kind of a neat way to study. You know, there's different ways of going through the Bible and studying. I like to look for these five Ps. I like to look for prophecy, pattern, principles, precepts, and promises. Now, a precept is like a law or a command, okay? So you look for prophecy, and oftentimes prophecies show patterns or, or patterns are in prophecy. And so you want to look for those patterns. We're going to see some of those patterns later on. We, another term for patterns, you might say, is typology, which is a big you know, Bible study word, but it's a pattern. We're going to see those. And principles, principles are always based on precepts, and a precept is a law. So you'll have a law, and there'll be a principle from that law that extends out into the rest of your life. And then, of course, we see promises. So tonight, we're talking about you are not your own. We're going to look at prophecy. We're going to see a pattern in that prophecy. We're going to see a principle from Jesus' teachings that attach to that prophecy, that regard a precept, and we're going to find the promise that goes with it. You see how that works? That's, you're not as excited as I am about that. Come on! That's exciting! We're going to use all five of these tonight, but look for those in Scripture. You'll see that they intertwine with one another, and you'll find them over and over and over again as we go through the Word of God. So tonight, let's start in Matthew chapter 4. Take your Bible and open, the Bible, open it there to Matthew chapter 4. There in Matthew, Jesus is being driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. He's just been baptized for you and I. He's just been baptized. And uh, in verse 1 of chapter 4, the Bible reads of the book of Matthew, Then was Jesus led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into a holy place, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, It is written, Again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Verse 8, Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto them, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Now, we've probably read that story time and time again throughout wherever we've studied the Bible, we've read it through. But I want to point out something very important here. We're going to be looking at some of the very same temptations that Jesus was faced with here. And Jesus gives us ample understanding of how we can deal with it. You'll notice how Jesus dealt with every temptation that came. He said, it is written. He used the Bible to be his defense. Right? And the New Testament tells us that the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. Right, And so the Word of God is that one thing that we can use when the devil comes to tempt us, we can parry with him and say, look, this is what God said. Don't use your own words. You go to the Bible and say, look, this is what God has said. So be gone. Right? This is what God has said. You might say this, and then the devil turns around and he starts using God's Word too. Did you notice that? In the second temptation, he comes around and he says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're going to use the Word of God? Fine. Well, the Bible says this. da 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 the fact is, he didn't quote the whole entire verse, though. If you go look up that verse, he, he missed the last half. And, and, and Jesus is countering him, and he says, No, 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 no. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And so Jesus quotes the Scripture again. And so each time, Jesus uses Scripture. Now, I want to ask you a question. We're going to be talking about something very important. I'm going to start in the third temptation, just for an idea. Now, God's, Jesus says, you should worship the Lord thy God, and Him only thou shalt serve. Do you know that people in this world today, all people all over the place, people serve a lot of things other than God before God, don't they? They make gods out of things, and they put things before God all the time, or before what God has commanded or said them to do all the time. We do it all the time. You could look around and you could see it all over. The, all over. Matter of fact, you know, well, we won't go into all of that, but you could see it all over. I mean, just, you just think about it. And, and we, get to, we move down to the second temptation, and here Jesus is, look at this, the devil took him up on a high pinnacle, right? Took him up on a pinnacle, he says, look, throw yourself down. 
God's going to save you. God's going to protect you. And what is he saying? Look, throw yourself down. Commit suicide. I mean, that would be for us, right? If you go stand on the pinnacle of some, you know, multi, you know, you know 15, 20 story building and say, oh, I'm going to throw myself off. But Lord, you love me so much, you're going to save me on the way down, right? That doesn't happen, does it? That doesn't happen. So I'm going to ask you a question. What's the difference if I throw myself off a pinnacle and kill myself quickly? Or if I choose to live in a way that kills myself and shortens my life, but a little less quickly. Are you still tempting God? I'm still tempting God, aren't I? Just because I'm not seeing the result of my choice right away. I mean, if I jump off a pinnacle of a roof, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to re- realize the, choice, my, <laughs> the result of my choice real quick, right? My life is going to end very quickly. Boom. But if I choose to live my life in a certain way, and I'm still do- what I'm doing, I know is shortening my life, just like jumping off that pinnacle, but it's, it's shortening my life, oh, but not as quickly, right? It's the same principle, is it not? What's the, what's the, what's the, what's the command based on that principle? Thou shalt not kill, right? Thou shalt not kill. Does it, matter, does it say thou shalt not kill quickly or thou shalt not kill slowly, right? No, it just says thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder. Right? God doesn't care if you, if you, you know, what's the difference between death immediately or death by a thousand cuts, right? Either way, you're killing. Whether you're killing somebody else or you're killing yourself. And Jesus said, I'm not jumping. I'm not jumping. Thou shalt not test, tempt the Lord thy God. Keep that in mind because these principles tie into what we're talking about tonight. The first temptation Jesus had. What did it say there? It said in verse 2, And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. Yeah, I'd be hungry. 40 days and 40 nights without food. I mean, that's, that's hunger. I mean, that's, that's near to the point of human death. I mean, that is close. I mean, when you really scientifically think about it, 40 days without food. I mean, that, that's a long time. And so he's at the, almost his weakest point. Think of this. He's at his weakest point. And the devil comes and tempts him and says, well, if you're hungry, and if you're the Son of God, just say, be bread and eat and fill yourself. And Jesus says, you shall not, man does not live by food, right? Bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And I know a few nights ago, we all said, we want to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I remember everybody's hand was raised. We wanted to do that. Here's a curious thing. Jesus was hungry, and he had no food to eat. And Satan said, make that bread. And Jesus didn't, right? What was he practicing? He was practicing self-control. Do you know that? Do you think it takes self-control to be 40 days without food and know that you had the power to change, not only change that rock to bread, you could say, you know what, Satan, be gone with you. I mean, really be gone with you, right? And he could poof and he'd be gone for good. I mean, he had, he had power at his disposal. The con- self-control that Jesus practiced there was beyond all of you and I can even imagine. But he's given us an example. Now in the Bible, self-control is not oftentimes called self-control. The Bible uses the different words. It's called temperance. In the Bible, the Bible says temperance. Jesus answered and he said, we have to use all those words. But in Acts chapter 24, listen to this. This is, how Jesus, this is what Jesus taught. Temperance, self-control. Acts chapter 24, verse 25. And as he reasoned, this is Paul now, as, as he reasoned of righteousness temperance and judgment to come Felix trembled and answered go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season I will call thee Paul the the gospel to the Gentiles this man preached the gospel what does the gospel entail righteousness temperance and judgment you're like wow the gospel includes self-control that sounds crazy I've never heard of that before well, Jesus was exhibiting it in his life all the time. And Paul is preaching about self-control, temperance. That's what that word is, self-control. Look around the world. Is there a lack of self-control? I mean, everywhere you look, 
Turn on the news. Where is it? South Carolina University or something? There's a lack of self-control on that campus right now. There's kids way out of control. You go down, look down on the, you look down in the city blogs on any big city, and you see the crime that happened every night. There's a lack of self-control. You look at all the people who've died from addictions. There's a lack of self-control. Part of the gospel is temperance, self-control. Galatians 5, 22-23, the fruit of the Spirit. Which this shouldn't surprise us. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. You know, it's, I, you know I always like this. Everybody loves to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. We're, we're, all, we're all happy about the, the, the you know, talk, let's talk about love. We love to talk about love, right? And we're all happy to talk about joy, right? And, and we're really patient with the pastors who preach about long-suffering because we don't always like to hear about that. And then, and then the gentleness and goodness and faith, oh my, oh my, we'd love to hear about that. And the meekness, well, once in a while, that's fine. But temperance? Don't preach to me about self-control, pastor, Right? Rare do we ever hear anybody exalting the fruit of the Spirit when it comes to temperance. And I think that was just strange because it was part of the gospel that Paul preached that made Felix tremble. So I think we should add it to our gospel. What do you think? I think we should have it in our gospel. I, th- I like it there. And so why would, God, why would Jesus talk about self-control? Because you are not your own. That's why it's there. Because you're not your own. And we have to understand who we are in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 through 20. The Bible says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. It says glorify God in your body, your physical body, and in your mind. That word spirit means mind. So you're glorifying God not only in your body, but also by what you think and what you're choosing. And, of course, your mind dictates what you're speaking, right? So that entails a lot of different things. But in your body and in your mind, glorify God. Why? Because you've been bought by the precious blood of the Son of God. And you are not your own. You know, some people struggle with what they're worth. You know, they say, oh, I don't feel like I'm worth very much. Look, if it was just you that needed saving, Jesus would have died for you. You are worth the life of the Son of God. That's how much we're each worth. And, and he says, look, you're not your own. I bought you. God created you. <laughs> he made you. And then you got, you got sold off into slavery, into sin, and He bought you back with His own blood. So you're twice His. <laughs> He made you and He had to buy you back. And He says, you're not your own. You walk with Me. I've given you that body. Your body is on loan. Your body is on loan from God. He gave it to you to care for, to be a steward of. Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7 speaks of this giving glory to God as well. Remember, we're supposed to give glory to God in our body and in our spirit. And it says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. Remember, we talked about that gospel that Paul was preaching. It's the same everlasting gospel. To preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of waters. Worship the One who created you. Give Him glory. In your body and in your mind, the Bible speaks of. And so now we understand this principle based on the precept that God has said. And now we're going to look at a prophecy that ties right into this. Because Jesus has given us this understanding. Look, you are not your own and I've given you an example of self-control. It's part of the gospel because it was part of the way Jesus lived his life. And, and when we look at that, we have to see that it wasn't just the words that came out of Jesus' mouth that are, is the teaching. It's how he lived his life as well as an example that should be our teaching as well. That's part of the gospel too. And so when we see how Jesus lived and we see what Jesus taught and we see how Jesus answered temptation, we see this idea of temperance. And now when we look at prophecy, at the end of time, we see this angel saying, give glory to God, give glory to God. And it's a message that God's people are bringing to the world. The Bible talks about that message back in the book of Malachi, in a prophecy. In Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. 
the Bible says. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. So the Bible is saying, before Jesus comes, I'm going to send you Elijah. Not literally. Or is it literal? We had that discussion. Is this literal? Is it literally Elijah coming? Is Elijah bodily going to come back? Or is this some symbolism that the Bible is using? Well, let's see what the Bible speaks of. Jesus speaks of it in Matthew chapter 17, this Elijah that is to come. From Malachi. Matthew 17, verses 11 through 13. And Jesus, answering his disciples, said unto them, Elijah truly shall come first and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah is come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer them. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. So Jesus said, John the Baptist is Elijah. Now, was he literally Elijah? No, he was John the Baptist, right? So John, Jesus says, look, when you look at John the Baptist, what he is doing, the message he is preaching, he is Elijah. He, he said, if you can handle this, he is Elijah. Now, what does the Bible say about this Elijah, this John the Baptist? Because we have to understand the Holy Spirit was speaking through prophets even before Jesus was born in Luke chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, speaking a prophecy about John the Baptist to his parents. It says, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of who? Elijah. And turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient of the wisdom to the just and make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now here's the thing. Before Jesus came the first time, God sent John the Baptist in the spirit and power of Elijah with the power and the message that just like Elijah had of reformation, of turning back to God, getting rid of your idols, saying, look, I'm going to worship the God of creation, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the God we're going to worship, the God of the Bible. And we're going to worship Him the way He asked us to. We're going to throw away all the idolatrous type of worship that He told us not to follow after the people of the land and all this kind of stuff. We're going to get back to the worship of God. And He was calling for reform. Read the story of Elijah. It's fantastic. It's powerful. It's meaningful because it's related to the end of time. And John the Baptist came in that spirit and power, reforming the people, restoring the people to repentance, preparing them for Jesus' first coming. And we look at the end of time, Jesus says, the Bible says in Malachi, at the end of time, God is sending some message, a messenger, a people, not just one person, but a people, with the spirit and power of Elijah, this message of reformation, this message of restoration, this message of getting back to the Word of God, to worshiping the God of creation the way He's asked us to. And so it's coming in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the people of the world for the coming of the Lord. Not the first time, but the second coming of the Lord. So he's sending a prophet, a prophecy ahead of himself, a message ahead of himself that is powerful. Okay? Now, do you you understand everybody's with me? We're on the same page? Okay. So we've gone from Elijah being all the way back in the Old Testament. Malachi saying, Elijah is going to come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, which is the second coming. Jesus saying, John the Baptist, he already came. He is Elijah. The prophecy about Elijah, John the Baptist said he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. So we know Jesus wasn't talking. He was literal. He's coming in the spirit and power. And that same spirit and power is going to be at the end of time. Okay? So, how did John live, right? The way Jesus lived gives us example of how we to, are to live. John the Baptist, if he came in the spirit and power of Elijah and God's people are going to be giving a message in the spirit and power of Elijah, then we too should be able to look at the life of John the Baptist and see if he had something in similar in common with Jesus, right? Because obviously he would, right? And I started off the night, of course, talking about what? Self-control, right? Did John practice temperance in his life? Self-control. That's what does the Bible say? For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. Matthew 3, 4, he said, And this same John had his raiment of camel's hair and leather girdles around his loins. I'm not telling you, you've got to dress like him. And his meat was locust and wild honey. So here it is. What I'm talking about here, remember God said we need to glorify him in our body and in our spirit. Right? 
And the Bible says John the Baptist was there and he was practicing the same type of self-control that Jesus was. He said, look, some of the things I'm going to allow into my body and some things I am not. And he said, I am not drinking anything that's alcohol. Not touching it. And there were certain things he ate. His meat was locusts and wild honey. Well, I understand the wild honey, but how many of you want to eat a grasshopper? Now, there's some, there's some talk, they don't know for sure if this was actually the bug locust, which the Bible says you can eat, and, or if it was locust beans, because there are many locust beans in the area, and they would be much more preservable because, you know, locusts, the little flying kind, they're seasonal, right? Unless they really came in hordes and you had bags and bags and bags of them, but I think they would smell after a while, you know? But you could dry locust beans and eat them, and they're tremendously healthy for you. And so John probably, and they need a little honey to make them taste good, if you've ever had had a carob bean, you know what I'm talking about. You've got to have a little honey with it. And so you've got to, you've got to, so you can, probably it was like locust beans is probably what it was. But uh, we, it's, it's kind of an ambiguous word in the Greek, so we're not really sure. So there it is. John the Baptist practiced self-control as well, just like Jesus did. In 3 John, verse 2, Jesus, or Jesus, well, through the prophet John, I guess, you know, I mean, it's God speaking anyway, right? But God wants you to be prosperous and in health. This is the promise. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. Even as you prosper in the mind, in your mind of the gospel, God wants you to prosper not only in health. He wants you to prosper in health. Which lends us to the idea of controlling what we put into this body that God has given us. To use. Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23, again, the spirit, fruit of the Spirit. We see temperance in the midst of the fruit of the Spirit. God wants this fruit of the Spirit in you, right? Who doesn't want the fruit of the Spirit, right? I mean, that's the whole idea. That's the whole evidence that the Spirit dwelleth in you. That's the evidence. That's the proof. So take your Bibles and go to 2 Peter. I'm going to show you a progression, okay? Sometimes in the Bible you see things happening and you'll see these, oh, it looks like a ladder. It looks like they're going, they're taking a step and then they're taking a step and we're going to see that in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. Peter writes, Whereby we are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add, no, listen, add, okay, right? So we're adding, so we're going to start somewhere, and we're going to continue adding this, and then onto that, we're going to add next, and we're going to add next, all right? Giving all diligence, add to your faith. So what do we start with? Faith, right? Faith is the groundwork. You, ha- you know, without, without faith, it is impossible to please God. You have to have faith. Okay, you have to faith that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus died for you on the cross. That the Word of God is the true Word of God. You have to have faith. What do you add to your faith? The Bible says, add to your faith virtue. So when you come to the Lord, what have we said time and time again? When you come to the Lord, you've been living in disobedience. You come to the Lord in faith, and He turns you from disobedience into a life of obedience, right? Virtue. Virtuousness is righteousness. Right living. True living. That's virtuousness. So from faith we add virtue, and to virtue now we add knowledge. Where in the world do you think we get more knowledge? <laughs> a hint, here in my hand. <laughs> this, is the f- this is the foundation of all true knowledge, is right here in the Bible. So from your faith you add virtue, right living, and now you go to the Bible and you say, Lord, I need to have more knowledge of you. I want to know more about you, I want to know more about you. Now what do you add to knowledge? And to knowledge we add, oh, there's that word, temperance. And isn't that how it goes? Once you know something, now you have to make the choice whether you're going to practice it or if you're going to rebel against it, essentially, when you're talking about a word of God. Am I going to do what God asked me to do or am I going to do what my flesh wants me to do? And if I'm going to say, no, I'm not going to allow my flesh to control me, I'm going to let the Spirit of God control me, now I'm practicing self-control and letting temperance, the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, work in my life. And I'm setting aside the things that I shouldn't be doing. And so to add temperance, we add patience, which you know if you're trying to add, you know, work on self-control, you need a lot of patience, right? Of course, you know. I mean, the Lord knows how we are. And, and to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity, which is love. For if all these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the, our Lord Jesus Christ. 
But he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your recalling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Isn't that a promise? That's a beautiful promise. If you allow God to work you in you and add these things to one another so that you're adding to your faith virtue and to virtue, knowledge and to your knowledge, temperance and to temperance, patience and to patience, brotherly kindness and to, you know, you're just adding it on and on and on. If you're allowing God to do that and they abound in you, the Bible says you will never fall. That's tremendous. So I think this idea of temperance is right in the dead center of that. I think it's important. Why does God say it? In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, he says, Whether therefore you eat or you drink, when whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. You're like, you know, you're making a lot of big deal about what I eat and what I drink. Well, the Bible does too. And he's saying you get to glorify God in your body and in your spirit, in your mind. And the Bible says whatever you do, whatever you eat or whatever you drink, Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. There's that giving glory to God again, just like in the Revelation message. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17, the Bible says, Know ye not that you are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, you're the house of the Holy Spirit, your body, and it's not yours. It's God's. It's the temple of God. He says, If any man defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And then, of course, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So what does it mean to defile? Because that sounded like a pretty bad thing. If anybody defiles the temple of God, God shall destroy him. Uh, do you really want to be a defiler of your temple then? <laughs> no, you don't, right? You, I'm like, Lord, I don't want to do that. I, you know, and God's not going to you know, strike you down immediate, right? But the wages of sin is death, right? That's the natural progression of sin. And so what are we looking at? How, does it, how do you, you defile your temple? Defile means to pollute or contaminate. So how do I contaminate or pollute this body temple that God has made me now that I've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit now dwelleth in me? And God says, you are not your own. He bought me back. And so I am not my own anymore, I am God's, and I'm taking care of His machinery, if you will, His temple. You know, if I would, if I would loan you my car, well, maybe I better pick somebody with a better car. If I would loan you Fred's car, <laughs> Pastor Fred's car, and, and, and you went and you said, oh, I need to borrow a car, and you say, yeah, 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 you could borrow Pastor Fred's car. And, and you borrow it for a week. And you bring it back, and the thing is, the, the trunk is like smashed up like this, and the front end is sideways, and the doors are half ripped off, and, and it looks like it's been in a demolition derby. Matter of fact, it does have the number eight on the side. And, and, and you, he's like, what did you do to my car? And he said, well, you, you said I could borrow it, right? He's like, well, what did you do? And he said, well, I needed a car for the demolition derby, so I borrowed yours, because I'm not going to use mine, you know, right? Well, you're using God's body that he gave you you taking it to a demolition derby i mean seriously that's what we have to think about that's how that's how god is viewing us he's like look i've given you this body to borrow to use to utilize for ministry for service to other people to care for other people to give me glory to to be a, a representation for me across the world in whatever capacity i want to use you because you're my vessel how are you going to return that to the Lord. How are you going to take care of that? You're painting a number on the side and looking for the, looking for the entry gate, right? Or are we taking care of it like we would really somebody's, you know, somebody else's thing? You know, it's like, wow, i got to take extra good care of this because it's not my own. I mean, that's usually what happens when you borrow somebody's tool, isn't it? That's when it breaks, right? I hate that. So I don't like borrowing anybody's tools because it's always going to break when I, as soon as I pull the trigger, you know, it's, it's like, oh, i got to buy him a new one. I should have bought my own one. So how do we pollute this temple? How do we pollute this body that God has given us? How do we contaminate it? Well, there's some serious things that people are doing in this day and age that are contaminating their body. And what we put into our body is how it contaminates. Smoking, alcohol use, illicit drug use, all of these things pollute our body to death, right? 
And that shouldn't be hard for us to understand when you see the effects of that. But remember, you know, Jesus was standing on the temple and he was going to throw himself down, right? The devil wanted him to throw himself down, which would have been virtually immediate death. We don't think so, so bad of this because it doesn't kill us right away. It's just we're delaying the shortening of the life, right? We're delaying the death a little bit. But we're still doing the same thing. We're shortening our life by using those ad- ad- different things. What about smoking? There's 4,000 chemicals in a cigarette. 100 of them, they're active poisons. 63 of them are known to be cancer-causing agents. And of course, we all recognize the nicotine is the biggest one. And so smoking is a, an issue that destroys the body. You know, you can take one drop of pure nicotine. If you, you extract one drop of pure nicotine and you drop it on the back of a rabbit, the rabbit will it'll absorb through his skin and the rabbit will die, like within minutes. Boom, he's dead. One drop of nicotine. You know how much nicotine is in a full-strength cigarette? Five drops. The only reason you don't die when you smoke a cigarette is because God made you fearfully and wonderfully. Now, your body can handle toxins and try to get them out, but it only can handle so much, and it starts diminishing and diminishing and diminishing, and then things start building up in you, and we get little black spots in our cells called cancer. Right? And that's how it works. So nicotine is bad. All these things. There's 440,000 deaths each year from smoking-related diseases. 300,000 children suffer upper respiratory ailments due to passive smoke inhalation. That's secondhand smoke. So when you look at that, you're saying, hey, this is not giving glory to God at all, is it? This isn't taking care of that body temple. Of course, you think of illicit drugs. We hardly have to go through that. 43,982 people died in 2013 from drug overdoses, from illicit drugs. Not to mention all of the violence and the, and the wars that go on and the people who die trying to, to run drugs and to fight for drug territory and, and all of these different things. I mean, the, the, the list could go on and on, the related issues of death that go with illicit drugs and the addictions that cause it. And did you know that not only illicit drugs, but pharmaceuticals? Over 300,000 people in 2014 died from pharmaceutical overdoses. Those are legal drugs. More, more by many more times than that died of illegal drugs. So we have to be careful what we're putting into our body, no matter if it's legal or not, right? Because in Colorado, some things are legal that aren't here in Minnesota, Right? And it does, just because the state says something is legal doesn't mean God said it's okay to put in your body. You have to see, what does it do to my body? What about alcohol? Alcohol, cost of alcohol use, $43 million a year is lost in work, medical expenses, and auto accidents alone. There's 100,000 deaths a year attributed to alcohol. 100,000 deaths a year. 800,000 alcohol, alcohol-related auto accidents, and 25,000 of those deaths of that 100,000 happen in those auto accidents. Alcohol kicks, kills six and a half times more youth than all other illicit drugs combined, and it's legal. No way that that's giving glory to God when I stick that into my body. And the Bible says an awful lot about alcohol. It's surprising how the Bible speaks about alcohol. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. He says, look, wine is strong and drink. They're raging. I used to be a bar manager. I can guarantee you when people drink strong drink, they become raging. I had more fights in my bar from people who were drinking hard liquor than were drinking beer. Because hard liquor, for some reason, but the Bible says it makes them raging. That's the way it does. That's the way it works. The the alcohol messes with your mind. One ounce of alcohol, your frontal lobe starts to deteriorate. You start not thinking properly anymore. One drink. Zap. Where does the devil tempt you? Right there. Why do you think there's so much sin in the bar? Because nobody has the capacity to resist the temptation because they've stuck so much alcohol into their system. And as soon as you take alcohol into your system, it starts deteriorating and tearing away at your liver and at your kidneys, and you're slowly, inevitably killing your body. There's no way that God says it's good for us. Proverbs 23, verses 29 through 32. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, look not upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup and moveth itself aright. God says, don't even look at it, because it's tempting. Why not? Because at the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Who's the serpent? The devil's a serpent, isn't he? 
So at the end, alcohol will treat you just like Satan will. So why would you dabble with the devil? You know, there's a reason they call alcohol spirits. You ever wonder why they call it spirits? Because you start putting that in your body, and the next thing you know, you're going to be inhabited by a spirit that's not of God. Because your mind is no longer in control of you. There's a reason they call alcohol spirits, folks. Isaiah chapter 5. What does the Bible say in Isaiah chapter 5? Turn with me there. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. 21 and 22. It says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes, but imprudent in their own sight. You know, the Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the ways there are are the ways of death. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink. Verse 23 says, Who, Which justify the wicked for reward, and take away the righteousness and the righteousness from him. Verse 24 it shows the end of those people, all these woes. Therefore, as a fire devoureth the stubble, the flame consumeth the chaff. So their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts. Kind of gives us an indication of what happens to the wicked at the end again, doesn't it? There's a lot of texts that give us that understanding. So it says, woe to them. Woe to you who, who take this wine, this, this alcohol into your system. It's woe to you. You know, there's, there, there's, there's a heavy message with being something that's woe to you from God. At the end, there's woes on the earth. But this is woe to the people who put alcohol into their body. In Isaiah chapter 65, verse 8, though, there's a different type of wine. Did you know that in the Bible, the word wine, whenever you see the word wine, you don't know whether it's alcohol or whether it's just non-fermented grape juice. The Bible doesn't, it uses the same word for both. So you have to look at the context, you have to see the context of all of Scripture to know how God speaks of whatever topic you're talking about, and then you have to understand the context of the verse. And then you have to say, okay, it says wine. Oh, is, that, is that vino or is that grape juice, right? We have to understand if it's alcohol or if it's non-alcoholic grape juice. What does the Bible say? Isaiah 65, verse 8. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. Did you know there's a blessing in grape juice? Just pure grape juice? You know, everybody says, oh, there's, there's, there's health benefits to drinking red wine. Did you know that they came out with a study just last year? They said, oh, wait, hold on. <laughs> yes, there might be some benefits from the grape juice that's in the red wine, but the alcohol content far out exceeds with detrimental effects to any benefit you would receive from the grape juice that's in the wine. It's still bad for you. The best way to get the benefits is to drink grape juice. Not fermented, because it's not destroyed. It's not polluted. And, and so that's why. But there's a blessing in the new wine of the cluster, the fresh grape juice. Matthew 26, 29, Jesus said, But I say unto you, I will not drink the, henceforth of the fruit of this vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus didn't drink alcohol. I mean, you think, think of all the scriptures in, in the Bible and the Old Testament who were inspired by the same Holy Spirit that was it, w moving upon Jesus. Jesus was God. He inspired the Holy Spirit to, 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 to inspire the writers of the Old Testament, he said, look, don't even look at wine. Don't even drink it. Don't put it in your lips. Don't look at it when it's red. He said, stay far from it. You think Jesus would have came to earth and said, oh, by the way, yeah, well, now that I'm human, I'm going to take part in it. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's the same God. He's going to be consistent in all of his teaching. And so we find this attitude of self-control. Look what the Bible says, 1 Peter 1.13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober... And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That word sober doesn't mean to be serious. It means to be not drunken. Don't have alcohol in your system. Be sober because you need a clear mind if you're going to fight the wiles of the devil because you need to be studying the Word of God. You need to be remembering the Word of God. You need to be able to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and be able to stop when you see the temptation coming and say, no, it is written. And your mind has to be clear in order to do that. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober. Be not drunken. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You have an adversary outside these doors. 
You know, sometimes we think the adversary is just God's adversary, but it's yours. He's waiting to devour you. He's waiting to consume you. He's waiting to have you destroyed in the midst of your sin, if that's where you're at. And the only reason we have life day to day is because God protects us from the destructive power of the devil and his angels. It's by God's grace you and I live day by day. And so we have to remember that, but it says be sober. Don't be drunken. Don't let your mind be taken away. Don't let your mind get, get messed up and, and distorted. And so here's the principle again. Garbage in, garbage out. Right? If you're going to put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out of your body. Whether it's, whether it's through your mind, through your eyes and your ears, putting garbage in or putting it in your mouth and destroying the body that God has purchased back with His own blood. What does it say in the science? Do you know that science today is proving what God has said from the very beginning? You know, we've kind of poo-pooed all the Bible. Oh, yeah, that, but science is proving the Bible over and over again. Here it is in this aspect as well. The impact of food and diet on the brain. Nutrition is a critical component of brain health and peak cognitive performance. Specific foods have the ability to either enhance or hinder focus, memory, and concentration. In addition to influencing people's mental capacities, food can also impact their brain in a way that impacts how they feel physically and emotionally. So what you eat, you are. Right? You are what you eat. Don't you remember that? That's exactly what you put into your body changes how your mind works. It changes how your emotions, how you react. It changes how you, how you physically feel. It, I mean, it makes sense, though, doesn't it? Because your body is symbiotic. Your, your mind and your emotions and your physicality, your health, are all intertwined. If you're stressed out and, and you're, conf- you know, you're, you're stressing out over something at work, you know how that is. All of a sudden, you don't feel good. Your immune system is depressed. They can even say that. And, and when your immune system is depressed, then all of a sudden your emotions are, oh, I don't feel good, and I'm gonna, not going to lose my job, and I'm going to be depressed. And, and you, it's just this roller coaster. Right? And, and it happens, and if we eat bad food... It affects us, and all of a sudden we don't feel good. And when we don't feel good, then we don't feel good about ourselves and our emotions. And then all of a sudden our thinking starts to change because our mind is clouded with all the junk that we put into our head. And it's just this right down in the hole. So what we do, mind, body, and emotion, body, spirit, and soul, affects one another. And science is proving that. And God said, look, it matters what you put into your body because you're mine. Because it makes a difference. What did God want us to put in our body to begin with? Right? Genesis chapter 1, verse 29. Now we talked about alcohol, we've talked about drugs, and we've talked about tobacco and all those kind of things. Now I'm going to get kind of personal because I'm going to peek into your refrigerator. Well, I'm not going to come over and peek in your refrigerator, but God might peek into your refrigerator because look what he had in his refrigerator at the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. That word meat means food. So God said, in the, Now remember, this is the Garden of Eden, right? There's no sin, so what else is there not anything of? Sin leads to death, and so there's no sin, there's no death. No death in the Garden of Eden. Nothing will die if they don't sin. And they're going to, yet they're going to eat. And so God says, look, I'm going to give you fruit of the tree and fruit of the herb. And, and so they could eat basically herbs and fruits and nuts. And that, so Because they, they could pick an apple and they could pick a grapefruit and they could, they could pick some leaves off of here and berries over here. And you can eat that and the plant continues to grow. There's no death. And that's the design God had. It was perfect people in a perfect place having perfect communion with a perfect God. And God gave them the perfect diet. The perfect diet for the body that you and I have. Because our bodies haven't changed. Adam had the same body you and I do. He just, he probably had, I mean, he was much healthier than we were because he had just been created perfect by God, right? But the body worked the same. He had the same lung system. He had the same digestive system. He had the same, t- same kind of teeth, those of us who still have teeth. You know, I mean, he had all those kind of things. I mean, but you have to know that God didn't change the way your body works. It's the same body. So the perfect diet for them should be the best diet for us. Genesis chapter 1, verse 30, then something happened. Oh, 1, verse 30. It wasn't just Adam and Eve that were vegetarian. The animals were too. 
And every beast of the earth, and every fowl, fowl of the air, and everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. Lions, tigers, and bears were all vegetarians, oh my. Right? And your cat didn't chase mice unless they were just playing together. No, everything was vegetarian because there was no death. There was no death. And God is taking us from a place of Eden, which was perfect. We're in this world of sin where there's death reigns because of sin. And we're going to a, a place where God is restoring us to this restored Eden where there will be no death again. So don't think that you're going to be eating the way we do here in heaven. Right? No way. Genesis chapter 3, though, after sin happened, God said, wait a minute. Now it's no longer perfect. Now he said unto Adam, he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of his wife, and you have eaten of the tree, which I commanded thou, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. He says, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sour shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. So after sin came into the world, then God said, All right, you've got the herbs, you've got the fruit, you've got the nuts, now you've got to eat your beets. Right? Now you have to eat it. Now the vegetables come in. Those they till the ground. So you've got you got your things that when you harvest them they die, but your the vegetables are good for you, right? And so now God added, but it was a de declining diet. Do you understand? It was a perfect diet, and then sin came into the world, and then God added something else because of the decline of humanity. So it was a decline in the diet, but God still added it. And so it's still pretty good, though. Still pretty good. You know why? How I know that? Because you look at how long people lived back then, right? I mean, how many of you remember how long Adam lived and Methuselah and all those? I mean, 900 years, 930 years for Adam. Seth lived 912, Methuselah 969 years, eating herbs and fruit and nuts and veggies. That's a pretty good lifespan. And then the flood happened, and then God allowed them to eat meat after the flood, and look what happened to the t lifespans. 600 years, 239, 148, 120. Now, when you get down to David, it's 70 years, and we're hovering right between that 70, 80, 90 range right now. Matter of fact, for a while in the Dark Ages, it was dipped way down to 45. You know, I mean, they, they were eating really bad back then. It matters what they put into your body. You know, and so now we're sitting there hovering around. And the only biblical reason, and I say that particularly, the only biblical reason for the change in the lifespan that we see. Such a sharp decline is the change in the diet. Because the diet was not this way before, and now all of a sudden it is this way now. Now it's interesting that God allowed them to eat meat. Now, So, so what I'm, we're going to talk about, the fact is that God does allow meat eating because He changed this diet, but God's particular on which animals should be eaten and which should not in His Word. So let's take a look. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 2, now let's go back to the days of Noah, right? Days of Noah, they're getting ready for the ark. They're getting ready for the flood. Just before God says, look, I'm, he's going to send a flood. I'm putting all the animals on the ark. And, and you know that after the flood, God is going to allow them to eat meat, right? He's gonna, they didn't know that, but God knew ahead of time. He's, so, and we know because we have the historical account. Afterward, they're going to get to eat animals. And so God says, look, I'm going to bring all the animals into the ark. And how, how did the animals go on the ark? Two by two, right? There was two of everything? Not according to the Bible. Not according to the Bible. Genesis chapter 7, verse 2. Of every clean beast thou shalt take thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. So God said before there was ever a Jew on the face of the planet, right? Because in Noah's day there were no Jews. It was just Noah and his wife and his family that were faithful, and the rest of the people were... Whew, off the deep end. And so there he was. They, so they took all these animals on, and he, God said, Look, these are clean animals, and these animals are unclean, which means these are unfit for food, for human consumption. Unfit for human consumption. One are clean, and this is in the days of Noah going onto the ark, long before there was ever a Levite, long before Mount Sinai, long before there was ever a Jewish law of nutrition. And so God designates, even before the flood, what's clean and unclean. So after the flood, when God said, look, you can, eat of the, all, you can eat of the animals of the earth, God had already told and taught Noah which ones are, should be eaten and which ones should not be eaten because they came on the ark. And this is, he, God said, these are clean, these are unclean. Noah would have known exactly which ones he should have eaten and which ones he should not. So what does the Bible say? Which ones can we eat and which ones can't we eat? According to the Bible. Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus, oh, I'm going the wrong way. 
Well, that was almost in Revelation. You, <laughs> definitely the wrong way. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, chapter 11, verses 2 through 8. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which you shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever part of the hoof and is cloven-footed and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall you eat. So here's the thing. They have to have a parted hoof and cloven-hooded and chews the cud among the beasts. Nevertheless, the, like, that would be like sheep and goats and cattle and deer and uh, elk and goats. Did I say goats already? Things like that. Those are clean Okay, those are clean beasts. But these, he says in verse uh, 4, Nevertheless, these shall you not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof, as the camel, because he chews the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he's unclean to you. So if you have any camel steak in your freezer, you shouldn't have it there. <laughs> right? Camel burgers, and maybe we don't have those here. And coney, because he chews the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he's unclean to you. And the hare... Because he chews the cud and divides not the hoof, he's unclean to you. That's the rabbit, the rabbit family. And the swine, though he divide the hoof and be cloven-footed, yet he chews not the cud, he's unclean to you. Of their flesh you shall not eat, their carcass shall you not touch, they are unclean to you. Why would God put such a restriction on food? Why would God do that? Because there's a specific reason that God said, these animals you should be able to eat and these animals you should not. Now he picks out the pork, the swine, that everybody, you know, we, we love our pork, we love our bacon and our ham and all that. But God said, look, this isn't good for you, this is unclean for you. Why is it unclean? Pigs are notoriously unclean. They are, they're, they're, their bodies are not designed like yours and mine. Remember I told you, you can smoke that cigarette, and the nicotine in that cigarette would have killed that rabbit if it had dropped on him, but you take it into your system. Your body has the ability to transfer toxins out and cleanse it, and you get rid of them. The cattle too. Ruminants have this fantastic ability to disperse the toxins in their system because of the rumination as well. And they have the ability to remove any toxins that come into them and their bodies interact with that differently and they can get rid of it. It goes out. These animals that we're talking about, especially the pig, that doesn't happen. When they eat toxic things, whether it be diseases or whether it be just chemicals and all these things, it stays in their body. It never leaves their flesh. And their bodies get full of this stuff. And they have a little, they have a little uh, uh, gland on the back of their leg, on the inside. And, and sometimes you'll see that weeping and draining. It's because their body is so filled with toxins, there's nowhere else to go. And it starts weeping out of their body. And then they have these little friends in their bodies called trichina worms. Full of trichina worms. Trichinosis is all over the world. Now, what does the science say about it? God said, these are unclean to you. What does science say? Must our pork remain unsafe from Reader's Digest? It says a single serving of infective pork, can, even a single mouthful, can kill or cripple or condemn the victim to a lifetime of aches and pains. Did you know that you get a pork chop and die? It's possible. And not choke on it. No, it, it, history has proven it. There's some, uh, for this unique disease, trichinosis, there is no cure. With no drug to stop them, these worms spread through the muscular tissue of the entire human system. One of two things then happens. Depending on the intensity of the infection, either death ensues, so you can die from eating pork. Or a successful effort is made to, by nature, your body, to throw an enclosure or a cyst around each of these teeming parasites, which then become dormant, although they remain alive for years in your body. Do not blame your doctor. All the best doctor can do is, as yet is to conserve the patient's strength and to try to relieve the painful local symptoms as they appear. Trichinosis can simulate, in some degree, almost any other malady. Physicians have confused trichinosis with some 50 ailments, ranging from typhoid fever to acute alcoholism. That pain in your leg or your arm might be arthritis, but it might be trichinosis. And you think, well, there's not that many out there. It's just here and there. Listen to what this is. This is autopsies. One in six autopsies find live trichina parasites in the tissues of their people. One in six. How many people are here? One, two, three, four, five, six. Oops, sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oops, uh, right? One in six have, and that's, you know, and, and in the U, reviewed, USDA reviewed 24 cases of trichinosis. 22 of them come from pork in the food chain. So the, the majority of the, almost 90% come from pork in the food chain. Highly unsafe for us to eat, even in today's society. What about the fish? 
Leviticus chapter 11, verses 9 through 12. These shall ye eat of all that are in the water. Whatsoever hath fins and scales in the waters and in the seas and in the rivers, those you shall eat. And all them that have not fins and the scales in the seas and the rivers and all that move in the waters, and any living thing which is in the waters, they shall be an abomination to you. They shall even be an abomination unto you. You shall not eat their flesh, but you shall have their carcasses in abomination. Whatsoever hath no fins nor scales in the waters, that shall be an abomination to you. God says, these things are an abomination to you. Why does God say not touch their flesh? The same reason with all the toxins and the diseases that are on them. It's readily transferred to you. And so God, when they're decaying, you say, oh, you don't touch it, you use a shovel. You know? So he says, these things you can eat, if they have fins and scales, that's fine. But if they don't have fins and they don't have scales, you can't eat it. You shouldn't eat it according to the word of God if you want to take care of the body that God has given you. So if you got catfish, bullheads, right? Eels, squid, which is calamari, if you try to hide it with a fancy word. Shrimp, oysters, clams, lobsters, crab. All those things from the ocean that people think, oh, they're so tasty. God says, look, you don't want to put those in your mouth. They're destroying the temple that I bought back with my blood. Because they're bad for you. They were bad for you way back then. God said, don't eat them to them. Now, why are they still bad for us today? What does science say? Prevention Magazine says, Why are shellfish so dangerous? Because they are many times more polluted than the filthy water they inhabit. Unfortunately, they choose to live and love and multiply in estuaries along coastal regions, and these estuaries are particularly subject to the discharge of sewage. Sewage effluent and other waterborne pollutions. The pollutant aspect of their habitat is one danger. The f- by fact that bivalve cell- shellfish are filter feeders compounds the danger. Oysters, for example, because of their way of obtaining and absorbing food, have been found to concentrate poliovirus up to 20 to 60 times the level of surrounding seawater. No other animal food offered on the menu of your favorite eating place will be served to you along with its feces. Yet this is the case with seafood. It's served whole, complete with its intestinal tract. You guys have all eaten before you came, I hope. Hopefully not seafood, right? No, but that's true. And all of this stuff, and all of the toxins of this, these creatures have taken in, they're filter feeders, which means they pull the water in, and they push it out through their body. And the water comes out pure. And all the toxins stay in their body. That's what happens. They're like, a, they're like, your, they're like your water filter on your water softener, right? Would you drink the water? Would you drink that filter? You want to eat that filter after a couple months, right? Yeah, I don't think you want to eat that, especially if it's filtering sewage. And that's what these animals do. They filter sewage. And that sewage, that poison of that sewage stays in their body. And then you go over to the Red Lobster, and there you are. Wow, let me have one of those. (laughs) You know, I was in college. When I was in college at NDSU, I took a class on entomology, which is the study of bugs. You had to do it for agriculture. It was kind of one of those required things. And they're going through all this entomology of all these different bugs. And they're, they're showing all of the families and the species and all that kind of, all that stuff. And the professor stopped one day. He said, oh, by the way, I have to show you something really interesting. He showed, he goes, here, look at this lobster, he said. See this lobster? Here's the, here's the kingdom, phylum, class, genus, species, all that. And he goes, look, look over here. Here's a cockroach. They're like kissing cousins on the family tree. They, he said, essentially, the lobster is an underwater cockroach. And I'm like, really? And it's right there. They're like, the same and i said that's the last time i ever had a lobster in my life because who wants to eat cockroach right so i don't i don't eat it because it's the same kind of critter and but this is the truth they filter the and they're filled with toxins it's the same thing that god said about the animals on land they're not fit to eat deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 24 god says the lord commanded us to all these statutes for the fear of the lord for our good always he's only concerned about your health he wants to preserve you alive it says as it is this day. God desires us to live and be in health, right? And so he's given us this this guideline to say, look, this is the best way to care for that body that I've given you and that I've paid for. And that's the way I want you to do it. God said that's that's the way it is. Now, some people say, well, now in the New Testament, all things are different in the New Testament, see, because we're on the side of the cross. But see, Jesus didn't die for pigs. And he didn't die for lobsters. And he didn't die for the unclean animals. He died for you and me. And creation didn't change when Jesus died on the cross. The thing that changed was how the law was satisfied for you and I. Those critters are still the same critters they were when Jesus was before he came. And you and I have the same body workings that we did before Jesus came. 
And so everything that way has remained the same. And so there's some text in the New Testament, though, when you read them, you're like, well, that, that gives me, you know, we get the okie dokie to do whatever we want, right? Some of those texts are interesting to read, though, in Acts chapter 10. Take your Bible and look at that in Acts chapter 10. Because remember, here, we let the Bible interpret the Bible. And we want to make sure that we keep doing that, whether you're here with us or you're home with yourself. In Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 17, Peter has a vision. Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, and he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending upon him, unto him, as it had four great, a, four, a great sheet knit in the four corners and let down to earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. See, Peter, still after Jesus had died and rose again, Peter's like, Look, I'm not going to touch anything unclean. Jesus never gave me the okay for that. In verse 15, And the voice spoke unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou a common. This was done thrice, and the vessel received up again into heaven. Now verse 17 says, Now while Peter doubted himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, so Peter's like, Lord, I don't even know what you're trying to tell me here. What is this? You want me to eat all this stuff? Jesus, the Lord never told us we should do that. Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius. So Peter is dwelling on this in three men. How many times did the sheet come down? Three times. How many men showed up at his door? Three men. You can actually find that a little earlier on in chapter 10. Three men came to his door. And they made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, lodged there. And while Peter thought upon the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. And these three men were not Jews. They were sent from Cornelius, who was a Gentile, and they too were Gentiles. They were heathen. They weren't worthy of the gospel in the mindset of the Jews. And Peter, when they come, he makes a choice to go with them. So we turn our Bibles a little farther on to verse 28 of the same chapter. Peter is now in the house of Cornelius, and Peter tells us now what the meaning of the vision on the housetop means. So the Bible tells us exactly what that vision meant. Peter finally got the word from the Lord, and he says, oh, this is what it meant. So, in verse 27, he's talking to Cornelius. Well, verse 25, as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together, and he said unto them, You know how that it is unlawful thing for a man who is a Jew to keep company or to come into unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Now you can go back in chapter 11, he, he reviews it again for the other disciples because they were like, you went into the Gentiles, man. You, you went and ate with these unclean people and you gave them the gospel. And it's like, he's like, well... Let me tell you what God showed me. He showed me this vision. The sheet came down. He said, what I have cleansed, call not thou common or unclean. And he wasn't talking about food, guys. He was talking about the Gentiles because they get the gospel just as much as we do. They were hungry. It's interesting. Peter was hungry when he had the vision, and these men were hungry for the gospel when they came. Cornelius was hungry for the gospel. And God said, look, Peter, you know how you're hungry right now? This man over here, this Gentile, he's hungry for the gospel too. You need to take it over here. So it had nothing to do with food. It had to do with the gospel. It had to do with the gospel. 1 Timothy chapter 4. We've got to rush now or I'm going to lose you all here. 1 Timothy chapter 4. You've got to turn there in your Bibles because you've got to see it for your own eyes. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Here the Bible speaks again about what we should be eating and what we shouldn't be eating. I keep shutting my screen off again tonight. Now, verse 4, chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 1. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly speaketh, or speaketh expressly, that in latter times some shall depart from the faith, 
giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods, meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them, which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. See, preacher, I can eat anything I want as long as I pray for it. Right? And that's what I always believe. As long as I pray over something, it's fine for me to eat. It doesn't matter what it is, even, even if God had said I shouldn't eat it beforehand. Well, wait a minute. What does it say? There's conditions in this verse that talk about what food is okay to eat. Look at what it says. It says that meats that have been created to be received with thanksgiving in verse 3. Well, did God create unclean animals to be received as food with thanksgiving? Not according to what He told Moses or Noah. Not according to what He told in a in Leviticus to the people, and Peter certainly didn't see any change, or he would have taught it. And it says, it also, those must believe and know the truth, there in verse 3. It, God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Remember, we're supposed to add to our faith virtue, and to our virtue, knowledge, and to our knowledge, self-control. We have to know what the Bible says is right and wrong so we can study what, and know what we need to know. And three, it must be sanctified or set apart by the Word of God. There in verse, four, or in verse five, it is sanctified by the Word of God in prayer. Just because the Bible says for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused, doesn't mean oftentimes what they were dealing with in the New Testament was, oh, they had offered that to an idol. And, and, and this wasn't offered to an idol. And that was oftentimes the issue. He's saying, look, but he didn't say anything about clean and unclean at all in the New Testament there. And sanctified by prayer. Some people say, oh, you know, well, if we pray for it. And I asked them, okay, how about this? You come over to my house for breakfast, and we're going to have a breakfast. We're going to have cocaine, whiskey, and cigarettes, but we're going to pray for it first. And so, but it would be foolish, right? You'd say, you can't pray for that, and God's going to do good to your body with that stuff. Because you know what? That those things are harmful to your body. Just like jumping off the temple steeple. It's harmful to your body. It's just a slower decline of your life. But you're still tempting God by putting it into your body. Just because I pray for it, that's not going to change it. It's still going to be bad for my body because we know what the truth is. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And so in the Bible, what I want you to know is the Bible says, look, there is a perfect way to eat, and then there's a declining way that God has said, okay, we're going to allow you to eat meat, but not everything is good for you, so because you are mine, I want you to set aside those things that are unclean, their pork and your lobsters and your snails and all those things in there the Bible talked about, you know, the things that have fins and scales in the, in the water, those you can eat, and those things that chew the cud and have the split hoof, those you can eat. But everything else I want you to stay away from because, hey, those animals, they're bad for you. I mean, there's some plants that are bad for us, too. We know that. But God has this, this wonderful ideal plan there back in the Garden of Eden. He had this wonderful ideal plan. So, yes, it's okay to have certain food, certain animals, but God had this plan of perfect, perfection in the Garden of Eden. That every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, which is in the fruit of it yielding seed, for you it shall be for meat. And when you look at consuming the flesh of animals, it's a detrimental thing to our bodies. Look at some of the statistics. Or there's a top five menu item is most likely to contain parasites. When you eat it, you end up with bugs in you. Escargot, you know, that's, that's snail, right? Angiostrongylus cantonesis might wind up in your brain, resulting in sickness, headache, and even meningitis. You can get worms from snails, very much so. Fourth, number four, sushi and sushami, raw fish. Two problems here, worms, ground worms and tapeworms. Number three, steak tartare, naturally steak or lamb tartare can offer excellent risks of parasitic infection. It's raw, raw flesh they're eating. Number two, pink hamburger, uncooked because there's a major risk of E. coli. You see it's meat, 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 meat. Okay, what's the next? Ham and pork. It's not even raw. Cooked ham and pork is one of the statistically risky menu items, and pork poses a host of other parasitic risks as well as undercooked or poorly stored. Tapeworms pose a severe threat that they sometimes spread into the host's eyes, spine, or brain with potentially fatal results. Almost done. Bottom lines, daily health news. Eat meat, die sooner. 
Now I'm just showing you, I'm showing you statistical scientific evidence that God's way was the best way to begin with. Okay? A large-scale study examining the effects of meat consumption on mortality has confirmed what myriad smaller ones have suggested. Frequently eating red and processed meats increases your risk of mortality by 33%. You're 33% more likely to die sooner if you're a meat eater than if you're not. That's a big difference. That's a big difference. To assess the link between eating red meat and the risk of premature death, researchers at the National Cancer Institute followed more than half a million people for 10 years. This is a huge study. 70,000 died over the course of the study. The size of the study which makes it so important. It provided an opportunity to investigate the relationship between meat consumption and your age at death. And it showed if you're a meat consumer, you die much younger, much sooner, much faster. Now, that wasn't God's original plan, was it? And that, you know, that's scientific saying if you eat meat, you die younger. Remember this? Adam, 930. 912, Methuselah, 969. Then there was a flood, and God said, oh, by the way, you can eat flesh. You can eat meat. And then you have Shem, 600, Peleg, 239, 148. Boom, 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 boom. Science. Is just reflecting what happened in the Bible and history already. Just what God told us. On the other hand, God's perfect plan, those foods that God designed for us to eat from the ground, fruits and vegetables contain vitamins and minerals that your body requires to maintain good health. There are also antioxidants in all fruits that help prevent disease, and some believe even aging. Antioxidants reduce free radicals by joining with them. Tons of research about the health benefits of fruits. Onions. I like onions. How many like onions? I love onions. They're fantastic. They're great for you. Onions, leeks, uh, uh, garlic, that whole family. They're high in vitamin C and chromium, but they also contain vitamin B6, vitamin A, calcium, phosphorus. However, it's not just the vitamins and minerals that make the onion a healthy addition to your meals. It's also the phytonutrients, flavonoids, onions contain the most prominent of which is quercetin. Quercetin is an antioxidant. It's a cancer killer. It's found in onions, and when combined with curcumin, it's found to, in turmeric is a powerful colon cancer preventative. So all these things that God designed for us to eat originally are healthy for our bodies. They build up our immune system. There's positive effects to this. On the other hand, legumes, beans, and lentils. Eating one daily serving, a three-quarter cup of legumes was shown to reduce your LDL cholesterol levels by 5%. That's your bad cholesterol. Just one three-quarter cup a day. According to a new meta-analysis of the 26 trials published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, just one cup of beans delivers 14 to 20 grams of fiber. That's more fiber than an average American eats in an entire day. You can get it in one meal. Lentils are a great source of iron. Everybody says, oh, you, you know, you ve- you're a vegetarian. How do you ever get iron? I eat lentils. I eat kale. Kale's fantastically high in iron. And all these things, God put it all into all the plants. Where do you think the animals get it from, right? Yeah, they get it from the plants, and then you get it secondhand. It's, the lentils are a great source of iron. One cup provides 37% of the daily value. And it, you can get that at besthealthmag.canada. Ten health habits that will help you live to 100. I'm going to show you one of them just because I like this one. It says, live like a Seventh-day Adventist. Americans who define themselves as Seventh-day Adventists have an average life expectancy of 89, which is a decade longer than the average American. Why do they do that? Why do Adventists live 10 years longer than anybody else? 10 years healthier longer. Why? Because one of the best tenet, basic tenets of the religion is that it's important to cherish the body that's on loan from God. Temperance. Which means no smoking, no alcohol use, no overindulging in sweets. Oh, we didn't talk about that. We'll get to that later. Fo- <laughs> Not tonight, though. Followers typically stick to a vegetarian diet based on fruits, vegetables, beans, and nuts and get plenty of exercise. It's the principle of Scripture that we follow, Right? It's a positive, uplifting principle of Scripture. Does God say it's a sin to eat meat? Absolutely not. Does He say it's detrimental? Are you, not, you know, are you not taking care of what He has given you if you eat the wrong things? Absolutely. You're tempting Him. You're putting things into your body that are destroying your body slowly over time, more rapidly depending on what it is. And He says, look, those things I don't want you to put in your body. I've, I've given you indication in Scripture. These other animals, that's fine. Go ahead, eat those. But you know what the perfect ideal for you? I want you to aspire to the f- perfect diet that we're going to be eating in heaven because, folks, we're not going to be having barbecue in heaven because nothing is going to die. We're not going to be slaughtering calves for burgers and sheep for lamb chops. It's not going to happen. There's not going to be any brats unless we make them out of carrots. 
No, I mean, nothing is going to die in heaven. So, I mean, that was God's perfect plan. And when he's going to recreate the earth, there's not going to be any sin, so there's not going to be any death. So we're not going to be running around killing animals. We're going to be eating the way God intended us to eat, the way our bodies work best. And because that's the way God intended it to be. Proverbs 4, 22, 20 through 22. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Why did God give us all these things? Because it's life and health for us. It's good for you. Now, maybe, has to, maybe we've got to have some self-control, though, when it comes to it, right? Because I used to eat a lot different than I do today. But I had to practice self-control because unto my faith I added virtue, and to the virtue I added knowledge of the Word of God. And the Word of God said, hey, look, Joel, some of those things that are out there that you're eating, I don't want you to eat them. They're bad for the body, and I bought that body with my blood. You're, you've got it on loan. You're not your own. So I want you to care for my body. So you can go around and and do the work that I'm asking you to do and be a glory to me. And I said, okay, Lord, but that's going to take some self-control because I really love my venison sausage. Right? I mean, yeah, some of those things I really enjoyed, but I put them away. I put them away because God said, look, there's a better way for you, and I want you to give glory to me. It's not about me. It's about him. It's not about me living my life so that I enjoy my life. It's me living my life so that I'm pleasing to the Father in heaven who sent his Son to die for me and you and buy us back. 1 Corinthians says, Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have of God. You are not your own, therefore you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. My friends, you are not your own. I hope you've gotten an indication of what God desires for us as a people at the end of time. He wants us to practice self-control. It's part of the gift, of the, part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in us. And He's given us the knowledge of what we should and should not put into our bodies so that we're not destroying the temple and defiling the temple of the Holy Spirit. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much. Lord, that you care so much about us, not just the grand scheme of the history of the world, but Lord, you care about the day-to-day life of each and every one of us. You care about how we, how we live and breathe and act and feel, and you care about our very health, Lord, and you've given us guidelines in your word that will keep us healthier longer, that we can give you glory longer, that we can do your work longer, Lord, that we can have more satisfying lives longer that we might serve you and so lord i pray tonight that we go home and we ponder this wonderful message from the word lord this message of self-control this message that starts there with jesus and we see in john the baptist having control over what he puts in his body lord and we know that you desire us to have self-control in our bodies as well i pray for your holy spirit to lead us and guide us tonight lord Keep us safe until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Tomorrow night we're going to talk about how to be free from bondage. It kind of goes along with this a little bit, so we're going to talk about it together. And then we're going to skip Thursday because we're not here on Thursdays. But then Friday we're going to come back, and Friday we're going to talk about Revelation's two witnesses. Revelation chapter 11. You can go home and do some homework before then if you want to read it and get caught up so you kind of know where we're going. Revelation chapter 11, the two witnesses there. And then on Saturday evening we're talking about psychic sorcerers and spiritual gifts. And then on Sunday we're talking about is heaven for real. And then we go to Armageddon and the U.S. and prophecy and the mark of the beast. And oh my, we're going to get pretty heavy in prophecy next week. So we're going to end with a bang. So that's what's coming up. So I hope to see you tomorrow night. We're going to be talking again about how to be free from bondage. You'd be surprised how many people are in bondage that need to be set free. And uh, just remember, as you leave, you can go from this place, but you can never go so far to be beyond the reach of God's love. He loves you. He cares for you. He's always loved you. God bless you, and good night.